we have this is one word in the microphone. We, so we have a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Ruby, um, I'm assuming you probably like, uh, came up with, like, what's the first story idea that you came up with that you were super proud of and thought, I want to make that into a big thing? I've got an answer for that. Um, uh, Mr. Strong joins the army. Um, I was six years old at the time. I, it, it was a very, very violent Mr. Man. <laughs> yeah. I think had I written today, I would have been sent to a child psychologist. But this was the 1970s in Scotland, so everything was a little bit more up, up in the air. I have no idea why you're handing this to me. Um, uh, <laughs> I wanted rid of it. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, I wrote some really terrible, terrible stories when I started out writing. Um, I mean, real, lock them in a drawer and not do anything with But the first one, I actually thought, oh, okay, I can do this. Um, it actually got published, and uh, I was... It ended up being part of a, a whole story cycle. It was, it was, um, it's all nonsense about um, uh, nuclear Armageddon and homeless children on the streets, and it was, it was up to my usual happy standard. Um, and uh, it ended up with you know death squads killing the homeless children. <laughs> Um, and uh, and then God turned up and killed the death squads. So so it was a happy ending in the end. So so that was all good. But I, I like that story. That was that was excellent. That was... Do you want? <coughs> no. I I, uh, I produced at the age of about seven. I did this kind of mashup of the clangers and wind in the willows with ray guns, so that everybody lived underground and uh, and was was completely destroyed on a small blue planet. Um, it didn't really go anywhere as a concept to be honest. <laughs> I used to write about fungus. Not that mine's going to be bad. <laughs> my, my first uh, big break was obviously um, uh, Wolf Hall and the Cave at the age of five. I think I'm sure everyone's read it, so it doesn't make any more introduction. <laughs> Uh, obviously, two of you have worked quite close together on Culture Simulation and in the writing for that. Uh, but how have all of you in general found working with other people if you've done that at all? Is, uh, like, is working with other people part of your normal writing process or is it just kind of a solitary thing for you? Working. I'm sorry. <laughs> with people. <laughs> no, I mean. Good lord. Um, no, why do you think we're writers? <laughs> That's, you know, I, I, it's, it's basically, you know, if. If I'm still in my dressing gown at lunchtime, it's a win. Right? That's pretty much, you know, it's just me and the cats. It's all good. No, don't work with people. Do the cats help? <laughs> That's not how honestly, cats work. Honestly, no. The cats do not help. Um, cats just cover everything in cat fur, including... I mean, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've typed whole novels looking around the cat because <laughs> it's sitting in front of the screen so no cats don't help but at least it's not people <laughs> <laughs> the microphone is being passed around and it's hot <laughs> um, I have uh, I've co-written novels um, with people I've also worked good lord um, I say people Stephen Dias um, I have uh, written in other people's intellectual property so I've had to cooperate um, with them uh, frankly it's a nightmare um, people are so wrong about so many different things <laughs> and just won't do what I tell them to <laughs> Um, the whole anarchy thing is just a sham. I'm basically a fascist. <laughs> <laughs> In my own this working... This is being recorded. Oh, is it? That's a soundbite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm basically a fascist who's not prepared for the information age. Uh, can somebody take this from me? <laughs> I don't know what to ask. <laughs> 
I, I have actually, in a, in a previous incarnation, I, I did co-write something with somebody else. Um, uh, looking back, it was a, a miserable and ghastly, unfulfilling process. And, uh, no, I never want to do it again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> normal human beings at the end that work with people like normal people. There you go. I should say in, in slightly more useful uh, advice. Oh! <laughs> now you know why we don't like other people. <laughs> yeah, these lovely gentlemen to my right have given me some great tidbits. Um, but, but I should explain like, we, we work together on cultists, as you say. Um, I think what we do is we divide uh, responsibility. Um, I think I can totally imagine it being absolute carnage if you get two full-time writers who have a disagreement about something creatively. Um, the way it works with us is Alexis is uh, the, the main writer, and I come from the there. creative director, <laughs> <laughs> like Don Draper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's a great analogy. Um, but, but, but I come from an English lit background, and I'm also his partner, which means he can't bullshit me. So <laughs> that's essentially how that works. Um, and yeah, I think it works as long as you have different skill sets rather than do. Have you ever worked with another writer directly that still lives? <laughs> <laughs> if you can call it living. <laughs> So I the thing about game writing is, is you know, game is this bit, and the amount of words that a human would produce in a reasonable amount of time is like this bit. So you need a lot of humans attached to a game in order to puppet put up enough words that it wins awards. And this applies all the way from CRPGs down to the <coughs> indie games uh, like ours. And very, very early when I was doing forward and up, you know the Sarlacc, right, in Jedi? So it's this fucking big pit in the sand, my like kids got, I can swear. Uh, if I think of the sound that absorbs everything and everything's digested over there, that is the appetite of players for content. <laughs> However many words you write, it's not enough and you're a failure because you haven't provided enough content. And trying to keep the content going in front of the players is like, what is some grommet, um, the wrong sound is when, when grommet's laying down, what is laying, what, what, well, grommet's laying down track in front of the train as he goes. So there's all this sort of thing. So you need to kind of, of, of uh, rope a bunch of writers together and point them at a keyboard. And that was my job for a while. I, I hired a bunch of people and got them to fill for in London and later Summer Sea and their other games and words. And uh, on a good day, it's really fucking great fun. It's like more like screenwriting, it's more like a sort of writer's room thing. You get four people with ideas um, and the ideas will mesh together to make this perfect astral configuration. And on a bad day, Somebody keeps saying, well, can't you provide an episode of Star Trek if we turned out to be a disease? And you just want to die, uh, kill them. <laughs> uh, and you make an excuse and go to the toilet and, and you come back and you change the subject and, and you give everyone a raise and uh, stop asking you questions and, <laughs> and cry. Uh, so that's my experience. <laughs> Actually, I want to change my yeah. answer. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm briefly going to add here is that, yeah, um, that it seems a very common route for writers to start off as dungeon masters, having crafted this magnificent scenario. From role playing games, not BDSM. So. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> it. Well, who knows? Um, yeah, that's and and, and you've, you've got, you know, you've, you've crafted this scenario, you've got all the non player characters, you've got a narrative, you've got, you know, gorgeous scenery, and your, char your player characters just spend the first. 20 hours arguing about how heavy a 20 foot rope is um, and you want to kill them all and then you become a novelist and uh, that's fine I just wanted to say how much I enjoy working with other people <laughs> in case there's anybody who would hire writers in the audience I really like other people please forgive my earlier comment <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I, I just briefly wanted to say that he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking other people. <laughs> I, I literally don't know why people are handing me the microphone. Is it because I'm sitting in the middle? I'm... Somebody save us with another question. I've got another question for Excellent. Uh, you mentioned Game Master as a long suffering Game Master myself. How many of the ideas for your books and stories have you stolen from games you've run? Uh, or intended to run. Or intended to run. Yeah, intended yeah. to run. That's, I mean, certainly um, my, my, you know, my first few attempts at, at fantasy writing and stuff like that were, were literally 
scenarios I designed for Dungeons and Dragons, and yeah, I mean, yeah. there is a truism that when you get old, you can buy all the RPG books you want, and you've got no one to play with. Yeah. Um, so yeah, novelist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my embarrassing uh, revelation here is, you know, that our game is Contest Simulator, and it's really embarrassing to admit that my favourite TRPG is by far Call of Cthulhu, for which I have written scenarios, um, which I'm glad to say I've not written the story of Contest at all, because they were rubbish. No, but yeah. <laughs> you have even played them. I've read them. Yeah. <laughs> not the same. What's yours? Yeah, I want to make a serious point. Uh, I, I <laughs> Steady on. <laughs> uh, well, seriously. So, eight years old, uh, I was sitting behind uh, two other kids in a swimming pool viewing gallery, and they had this book with the blue dragon on the cover, and they were talking about hit points. And I sort of, you know, my life changed at that point. And I went home and tried to get my brother to play a uh, homebrew version of DD with me, he wasn't interested. Uh, and I spent the next 25 years plus, 25 years, um, enthusiastically uh, uh, DMing stuff. And then I realised in my mid thirties that I really wanted to do something creative for a living. At the time, I was <sighs> doing websites for fintech companies. Yay! Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I was having, getting a lot of creative satisfaction out of running um, uh, tabletop games and sort of mid-sized larps and things. And I just realised, uh, as long as I did that, I wasn't going to do anything creative for a living because they, I, I'd get all my satisfaction that way. So basically, all the DMing I've been doing for the last uh, 12 years um, has been making games, uh, digital games. And, and, and so all the ideas that might have gone into tabletop games and then into digital games just go straight piped into, into the middle of it. Straight past me. Um, not exactly Dungeon Masters, but certainly from playing games. Does anybody here remember a thing called the BBC Micro? Yeah. Yeah. Wow! Oh, it's got a fan shop! Hasn't it? <laughs> Did anybody ever play a game on the BBC Micro called Elite? Oh! Fantastic. Yeah. 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 You did? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay, just learned something. Um, so every time I write about people docking spaceships or manoeuvring in space. I've actually got this line drawing of a BBC Micro spaceship <laughs> rotating very slowly as it joins up. That's my And guess. an 8-bit version of Blue Danube. <laughs> yes, that's not We, myself and Stephen Diaz, uh, wrote a time for um, Elite Dangerous, the new one. Oh, right. And we dedicated it to um, all the cobras we killed trying to dock. Yeah. Uh, to answer the the um, uh, the, the role playing game question, um, I found quite early on that what worked as a novel narrative didn't work as a game narrative, and what worked as a game narrative didn't work as a novel narrative. And the one time I tried to turn a role-playing campaign uh, into a novel. Um, it was nightmarish. Uh, so I... I don't think I played that one. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of... It's like nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. There you go. What was I talking about? I, can't, I kind of try and keep them separate. Uh, what I do find is, I mean, I'm, I've, I'm still running games. I run three games a month. And um, uh, by the time you finish writing all day and then you come to write a scenario, it can feel a little bit like a busman's holiday. I think we need I've got, I got uh, one more thing. Just something I said in my talk at the very beginning, actually, was sort of extended prologue about how I don't... I can't really do linear fiction, it's non-linear stuff in games I'm, I'm, um, I'm decent to. Uh, but one of the reasons for that, as I said, is that if you are running a game, it is not only acceptable, good practice to put an obstacle uh, in what you plan to do and say that the players will do something 
to get around it and hear some thoughts I had about what they might do. But basically, they'll come up with something. Because they always do. It's always something fucking different than it's that. <laughs> so, you know, w- when I sat down to write a novel, basically, I sort of got to the first point I wanted to put some sort of setback or challenge. And, and, and I found myself basically saying, okay, the, the characters will do something to get around this. And I found that doesn't work if you're writing a novel. You can't actually hand it over to the... Uh, the, the reader and say, yeah, can you make the characters do something to get around this? Uh, so that's why we games instead. I'd say as well, going back to, to what you said about how difficult it is to translate narratives from different mediums, mm. whether it's a, a book narrative or a game narrative, one of the basic fundamentals of game design is you have to start thinking about the verbs rather than the plot, because obviously the game is about the, the player experiencing something and doing something and you can choose to have a very like verb light game like you know like a walking sim or something but, but you still need to know what the player is actually going to be doing as they experience your narrative um and, and like to take a random example you know one, one of uh what's considered to be one of the best books in the english language is something like middlemarch by Eliot, and like fuck all happens in Middlemarch and it's a great book but imagine making that into a game like day one you exist in a small village in the 1840s day 100 you're still there <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult to, to do that I thought your favourite book was that D&D book shut up he always refers to Beowulf as that D&D book <laughs> <laughs> so it's the one with all the boss fights <laughs> ignorance <laughs> <laughs> uh, early Anglo-Saxon <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons. Does <laughs> no. the mic anymore? No. <laughs> Doesn't a question and more of a point, but I can already think of at least one terrible adaptation, video game adaptation of a novel, which is Douglas Adams' Titanic made into a game. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's the only Star- game. Titanic game. Absolutely terrible. Because you don't know what you're supposed to be doing next half of the time until a while gets. Uh, so I want to know what kind of challenges you come up with trying to get writers to come up with game material when they don't know their players yet. I think I was going to say Titanic is literally the only CD game I ever returned to the shop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pretended it didn't run on my PC. <laughs> and the guy who obviously didn't think it was quite, quite, quite cross. Um, Question Chris once told a story about passing exams. He said that, that what you do is you go away and, and study uh, uh, China uh, for a geography exam, and when you come in the next day and the exam is uh, all about France, or anything about France, your first sentence is France is not like China. And uh, what I found uh, for a lot of new enthusiastic game writers, because, like I say, a lot of game writing is more like screenwriting. Their first sentence basically is, is you, know, you say, okay, this game's about France. They say France is not like China. Uh, they have a story they want to tell. The, the, okay, so you, you give somebody a writing test for, for an interview and, 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 and like six people will, will respond to the writing test. Um, and the writing test is something like, write a story of, 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 of a, uh, the Kogoda game of an inn where one of the people is a, a weirwolf, kind of a hate like thing. Um, and like five people will write stories where uh, one of the uh, people is a werewolf um, and the sixth person, ah, everyone's a werewolf. Uh, or the real werewolf is you. <laughs> <laughs> or the friends you've made along the way or, or whatever. And, and it's, no, you, you, you don't want to do that. The whole point is the artists have spent uh, all week drawing this one werewolf and, and uh, we can only animate one werewolf at a time. The, the tech constraints uh, come first here. So stop trying to be fucking clever. Save that for the Doctor Who's next strip, which you know, they, do the, they can have the budget do what they need after the fact. So you, you, um, I, I think the best way to, when, when somebody sends in a writing test along those lines, you send them a polite response back and then cross out all the swear words. But uh, the, the best way to, to get people to understand what they need to do is to explain the constraints. Because as soon as you actually say, we don't have the answers to do that, there's a really bad uh, conversation in one of the early Mass Effect games where um, the NPCs inexplicably present the player with a really significant moral dilemma straight off the bat. And the reason for that is they had to strip out a lot of explanatory dialogue 
because there was only so much memory on Xboxes at the time, and they, they had to sort of shrink it at the, at the last minute. Um, and if you, if you can give your writers a sense of the constraints involved, whether that's in terms of, of, of VFX and FFX, or it's in terms of size, or in terms of basic stuff, like when I was doing my bio, I guess, writing gig, I, I sort of wrote a bit of dialogue that said sort of player name here, and they said, dude, you can't do that, it's voice acted. <laughs> <laughs> then that, that's when you get the best out of them. I'd say on top of that as well, um, that, that I come at this from more of a production angle, like I'm actually a producer by trade who has this like literary background rather than actual writer. Um, and I, I've, I've seen a lot, if you give writers the freedom to do what they would normally do in, in the space of their own cat-filled homes, that they will come up with amazing <laughs> narratives and in an ideal world you will make that narrative live because they're, they're, good, they're writers, they're, they're professionals, they've probably got a good idea. But, but reality doesn't happen that way. Either you don't have enough money, or, or like you say, you've only drawn one wolf, or like whatever the problem is, problems will come across uh, along the way. And writers, being usually the cheapest, um, are the ones who often have to <laughs> fix the problem. Damn cheap, I'm hiring him. Um, and uh, that means that you often find over the course of, of game development that the narrative itself like gets warped into this ultimately quite unhappy thing. And writers are happy with it because it's not their vision and they've had to patch a lot of holes. And the consumer, the, the, the player, um, who eventually ends up with the product, either takes the CD back to the shop or, or ends up thinking, like, well, I thought the start was really exciting, but that ending was a bit crap. Um, and, and I'm sure all of you can think of examples of something like whether it's film or TV or, or books or, or not books, games um, or whatever, where you've, you've felt at the end it was an odd choice on behalf of a writer that you otherwise respected and thought was pretty good. Um, and I think if you can do it the other way, if you can make sure that people know what their constraints are up front, then it becomes basically like an escape room and the writer can think, how can I get myself out of all of these problems? And writers are the most like, inventive person often on your team because they only have words to work with. So if you present them with a problem that's clear, they can, I'm, I'm sure they can solve it. The problem comes if you say, you've got all of this stuff you can do, and then all, like, you know, for months and months you say, you have to change that. And, and then they get depressed and go home. <coughs> writers prefer that as well. Prefer being depressed? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and no, writers prefer it when they're given the constraints, when they're working in other people's IP, because you've... If, they, if you're not given the, the constraints, um, you find yourself doing an awful lot of writing and somebody going, no, 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 exactly. no, no, no. And you're just sitting there going, okay, so now we've established what you don't want, can you tell us what you want? Which has been a lot of my experience in working with other people's IP. So you, you do a lot of words because we are so cheap. And then you find out what the, the client wants. Uh, I think in, uh, I believe it's called failing faster. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, there you go. Um, I think we, we exhausted that one. I think yeah. so. I think there's one, one more point I want to make, just very briefly. In, in games, the, you get, you know, sort of uh, hierarchy of creatives. And in most contexts, not in all contexts, not if you work for one of the big CRPG companies, but in most contexts, at the bottom of the tree, there's the writer and that dude who draws all the shrubs in the tree. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, about works in games. Yeah. We're friends. <laughs> it's all good. I'm hoping one day to be promoted to drawing shrubs. <laughs> No, 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 oh, that, 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 right. no, that small sad reflection is the end of that. <laughs> More questions? So I know at, at, at least one of your talks covered some of it, but do you mean particular um, literary influences or in other media that's the influence of the work you do? <laughs> He's not in, give him the... <laughs> no, so you heard the tip, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um... And it's not the science fiction authors I mentioned on the whole uh, when I was uh, when I was doing my quick talk because they, you know, yeah, Clark and I like they're there. I read them when I was a kid. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily go out and read them now. Fine. Um, and it's not necessarily science fiction either as well. Uh, and some of it's perhaps a bit surprising. One of one of the biggest influences on the way I try to write is. Uh, the last of the Moomin Troll books. It's called Moomin Valley in November. And it was unusual <coughs> because it was much less childish, much more adult, much more melancholic and reflective. And it also had a very fortunate translation. Um, 
And I can almost quote the, you know, the opening of it, or one of the opening lines of it, you know, from memory, which is the quiet transition from autumn to winter is, winter is not a bad time at all. And there's this lovely little reflective passage which does such a lot with such a little. Another influence for sort of the same reasons, big emotional power, not that many words, is John Steinbeck. Um, not necessarily in the longer works, although when I, I read uh, Grapes of Wrath and was blown away by. Uh, but things like Canary Row, where he's writing about, he, it's world building to an extent, you know, he's describing the world of Monterey, California, a vanished world, you can't really, you can look at the buildings that are still there, but you can't breathe the atmosphere, but he somehow translated the atmosphere, and he did it, when you read it, it's so economical, the picture you come away with in your head is so much bigger than the fairly limited words that Steinbeck uses to describe it and describe, describe the eccentric characters. So, so those two, I think, pretty, pretty massive influences. Um, I, I don't know. I, you find yourself being influenced by absolutely everything around you, whether that's pop, popular culture, the, the, the landscape or the cityscape, the people you know, what have you. you. You take all sorts of things from all sorts of people. Um, in terms of writers and media, um, <coughs> certainly my first couple of early novels were pretty much a love letter to James Cameron's Aliens. Um, I'm not sure whether I've outgrown that or not. I don't think I have outgrown it. Uh, I'm also a huge fan of Michael Mann films uh, in terms of writing, uh, Ian Banks all the way, whether he's writing uh, literature or science fiction, uh, but you know, I'm very much a fan of sort of popular culture, pulp, uh, you know, pulp fiction, that kind of thing. So that's where I'm taking a, a, a lot of my pointers from. Not, not nearly as hard <laughs> I, it's one of these impossible questions because you, yeah, I, yeah, Andrew's already covered it. You know, you're influenced by by everything, um, and uh, I, I I take a lot from politics. Um, I take a lot from science. Um, I take a lot from nature. Uh, I. And yeah, you know, again, I, you know, I've spent a long time playing role-playing games from sort of sixteen onwards to uh, mid twenties. Um, and yeah, I you know, Call of Cthulhu is is absolutely my most favourite role-playing game in that. Yeah, you could pretty much guarantee you would either be dead or mad at the end of it. And that kind of sets a precedent for a lot of my books. Um, um, it, it's also life, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Exactly. It is, it is, it is life if you, you know, no one gets out alive. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, a, a lot of my stuff is, is, is literally, you know, Hero barely makes it to the end with some of his body parts <laughs> intact, um, and it's like sort of, can he just crawl over the line? Can he? Can he? Oh, sorry. Um, and and but yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of politics in there as well. Um, I mean, I don't come from a political family, um, but I I am so egregiously left wing that it's almost embarrassing. <coughs> Um, I mean, you know, I, I went for, um, I went on a, a week's holiday uh, up to Otterburn, um, North Northumberland, and they've got a firing range there. When I say firing range, and we're talking rockets and tanks firing range. And obviously to delineate the, the outside of this area, which it's incredibly dangerous to, to even walk over, um, they, they fly red flags and I got all excited. Um, but that's not what they were for. Um, so <laughs> so th there was that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I say, if, if, if you, yeah, I mean, my, my books are, are, are incredibly political. Uh, I've got one coming out, uh, a small press book uh, later on this year uh, called Bright Morning Star, which is, which is so ridiculously political, the, um, my editor basically said, no, we can't put that in. Really, no, just don't put that in because people just get upset by it. And I thought, ah, fair enough, I've got the rest in. We'll be. I 
Amin. Da jūs to kādīt. Ailai muscular lapidary growth. So, Zelazny, Barnes, Le Guin, Chesterton, Chandra, a lot of men, all women, but Le Guin, it's not like Le Guin Crowe, it's Clive James Crowe, another man. Uh, but Clive James said, all I can do is turn the phrase so that it captures the light. And the Green can do that. You just, just turn out these things are perfectly quotable. You can read them when you're nine and come back from years later. But I like uh, writers who, 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 um, who use the language um, the way that a jewel uses materials or, or a potter uses clay. You're really putting together attractive artifacts in, in their own way. That's the influence. Game designers, it's Sid Mayer, who is probably the most famous game designer ever to live, who said uh, useful things like a game is a series of interesting choices. And um, uh, Greg Kostikian, who wrote a really seminal uh, uh, game design called I Have No Words But I Must Design, uh, as a tribute to. Um, and Sora Dobson, uh, the designer on, on Sid 4, who does his astonishing um, uh, uh, intellectually robust talks about, about design. So that's a really sort of straight down the middle specific answer, sorry. No funny stories. I think we're good. In the green. Um, or just the, the games I guess, but um, how would you make decisions on like, you know, when you're giving players you're skills, right. like, oh, you're getting better at thievery or you've got this art. Like, how much, how do you make a decision on when you, whether you want to, the player to be able to see that mechanic, like they want to see that number go up, I want a plus one to this skill, or do you want them to not see it so that, you know, you can surprise them later with, you know, so, so you don't know that the person who's, well, was called by rats or whatever will come back. I do, I do, and I can be mercifully brief. Um, I, I'm an absolutist on this, and I have had criticism for my absolutism. I think you show the player fucking everything. Um, Ford in London, Southern Sea, and, and Cardiff Simulator, all specific new design methodologies where it, it is uh, very hard for anything to happen in the game that is not visibly tracked for the player. Because I, I, I think it's important for people to see the immediate consequence of their actions, even when the sort of you get a, a, a variable change has got an obscure name. I, I want to show it. Um, I can think of two or three other designers in the area I use who would basically burn me as a heretic for that. But they're wrong, and I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Visible design is actually one of the key um, design principles of, of cultists. Uh, so, so you'll notice if you play the game that, that everything is expressed to you and maybe the UI could be improved, which is basically my fault, so fine. But, um, but the intention is that you see everything. And I think um, gamers have evolved a great deal over the course of the short industry. I mean, it's been, I mean, I'm a millennial, right? So I don't fucking know any fun. Like, Sid Meier's, like, being nothing to me. <laughs> see, I love it. Um, and and, and what, what, what is relevant to me, though, is that I think I understand games. Like, the voice of, of gamers now is I think I'm a designer because I've played a lot of games and, and in one sense they're, they're correct um, I think if you really care about the medium and, and I'm sure everyone here is an avid reader I think you guys probably consider yourselves quite good at, at distinguishing um, good writing from bad writing but you might not all be writers here but I think you've developed those skills um, so if you hide things from the player like take for example um, RNG which is random number generation if anyone doesn't know and you would not believe the sentience that gamers believe exist in the simple act of random number generation. Like they think it's rigged, they think you've got their IP address, they think that they used to date you and they were mean to you and somehow you've made this game to hurt them. Um, and, and obviously that isn't, isn't true, but in the case. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you get yourself into a real pickle. By, by get, allowing these spaces for people to, to think that something is going on when it really, really isn't. And that's on top of the fact that you can never, ever produce a bug-free game. Even if you're Ubisoft and you have a bazillion pounds, you're never going to produce the perfect game. So there's always going to be a problem that someone runs across. So they'll always think, oh, it's broken! Um, and if you leave, again, dark spaces in your game, people will think it's broken there because it should be telling them things. 
Um, and I guess it's the dark side of apophenia that you were talking about earlier. You know, people see faces and things, but they also see demons. Um, so, yeah. I'm not sure if any of us have got anything to add to it. <laughs> no, no, it's not really. Um, apologies if this has uh, been covered or you've been covered. But uh, I'm going to ask you a question with respect to uh, ethical gaming in terms of making ethical decisions and the consequences. Um, it seems to me that to date, uh, the ethical sort of gaming uh, mechanism or mechanic it is fairly unrealistic in that you get a small time to <coughs> it and then a larger benefit later on. Whereas in real life, altruistic decisions tend to be small term, local benefit, and then the medium term is benefit if there is any benefit at all. It's going to be a long term, very general. Now, so that seems like an excellent game mechanic to actually make the game harder for those people who really like their games to punish it, think of Dark Souls or something like that. So, do you have any examples that you can think of of someone who's really nailed that particular game mechanic? Don't say me. I, 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 I've won, <laughs> and, and, and I, 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 um, uh, and unfortunately, it's not one that's ever enacted. Um, Peter Molly knew the notorious visionary charlatan entrepreneur, uh, depending on what you think of him. Apparently, for Black and White, the, the God game uh, that his studio made, there was originally a plan to do as follows you could buy a white or a black edition of the game. And both of them had identical code, one was good, one was evil. Racial politics are slightly complex, but leaving that aside. Uh, the white version cost five quid more. And the five quid went to charity. But the problem is that the, uh, fundamentally gaming activities are, are disconnected from the real world. So they're all fundamentally trivial in, in, the, in, in the, the literal sense. that it's hard to make that connection without no longer making it a game, I guess. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> the actual gaming person, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, I think there are two things that I would add to that. One of which is there's a game called Spec Ops The Line, which is one of my go-to examples of, I think, um, ethics done interestingly in games, uh, where it's a kind of classic, on the surface, it's a classic, like, soldier narrative. So you're a big, burly, white soldier sent off to somewhere exotic and full of people who don't have the same colour skin as you, and you get to shoot them. Um, which is essentially something that goes unquestioned in a lot of mainstream video games. And I'm glad to say that now people are beginning to rethink this a little bit. Um, but Spec Ops puts you in the beefy shoes of a, of a marine or whatever and says, go kill these people um, who aren't like you. And over the course of the game, you do a bunch of these things that are considered normal by gamers. Um, and in the loading screens, you start to notice something quite interesting happening. Um, in most loading screens of big games, you'll tend to get like hints, which will either remind you of particular command inputs or, or particular things you should look for in the world. And over the course of Spec Ops, the uh, loading screens change from saying useful things like this to saying things like, you did the right thing, or you were still a good person. And the narrative builds up to the point where you have to end up making what you feel are required choices of you because you are within a game. So I think the, 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 the sort of climax of the, of the ethical quandary is you end up having to um, explode uh, a gate to get into the city that's full of bad people about to launch a bomb and kill millions, so super bad news, but to do so you have to sacrifice the lives of you know, 10 innocent children because they're all holed up in the same area. And you feel the game is, is pushing you mechanically to do this because it's the clear line of progression. So you do it, but then you've murdered 10 children and the game doesn't really let you forget that. It doesn't stop and say, you're a bad guy, you should not have killed the kids, because that isn't fun. And I think particularly in a, in a, a medium like games, complicity is, is really complicated. So we've talked before about the fact that Lolita is obviously a really interesting um, literary way of thinking about something that lots of people think is probably unethical, and, and it, it's a really interesting insight without being a sort of dogmatic, here are some things that are good and here are some things that are bad. But if you put um, Humba Humba in a game, and you tell a player that you're going to spend 20 hours role-playing a child molester, you're not going to sell many copies of that game because people don't want to do that. People enjoy buying a black copy of a, of a box and saying, I'm going to role-play a baddie, but it's never usually a baddie that really compromises your ethics in that way. So I think, I think you've got to be a bit sneakier about questioning people's ethics in games. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of games. Um, if I say Knights of the Old Republic, <laughs> thank you. Um, and that was before my XP computer finally died. 
um, and apparently it's it's almost impossible to port it into into the newer versions of Windows, which is a real shame. Um, that allowed you to choose the dark side as instead of the light side, and and there were some interesting consequences of going to the dark side. Um, and, and, you know, since Civ has already been mentioned, um, you can play Civ however you wish. Um, and it's obviously fun to build a massive army and absolutely steamroller all the other factions. I mean, let's not, let's not two bones about it. Um, you can be as culturally imperialist as you like. You can just, just, just all helicopters and tanks and let's let them roll. Um, and and yeah, you don't you don't care about their culture. You don't care about their art. You don't care about their populations. You just steamroll it. And then, in the progression of the game, you started to get political victories and cultural victories, space victories, where. If you were careful, you didn't actually have to fight anyone. That was an interesting thing to do. It's uh, just as, as an example of um, what you're talking about, the, uh, I think it's Jedi Academy, where halfway through your given a choice of whether to go to the dark side and kill some other friends or not. And if you do choose the dark side, it doesn't actually make a difference. It makes it harder because not only are you not fighting the Jedi, you're actually fighting the Sith as well because you're trying to take over. Yes. So that, that would be an example that I can think of very simplistic of a game mechanic where trying to do a certain thing makes the game a lot harder rather than being rewarded after five minutes. Yeah. Well, Undertale makes it really hard to be good. Like, uh, like I say this as someone who hasn't finished very Undertale. Very Undertale. I've been playing it. I've just been told that the way I was trying to play it of being too good was almost impossible to finish it, and no wonder I was frustrated, and no wonder I gave up because I wouldn't kill anyone. <laughs> so I think that's an example of a game making a good point about altruism being the hard path to take, and I think a lot of games, you know, oblige you to choose a, a path, a warlike path, but not necessarily one. But then it gives you a safe space to explore. Being cruel, the whole point about altruism is meant to be good, not to be good. Yes. There is a problem with a lot of games that there is very little to do if you're not going to be killing people. Um, the example, the example, and it's come, go back to the beginning, elites and <coughs> games have been offered, such as Unit, which is the public domain one with the good graphics. Um, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can play it, it's almost impossible to progress if you don't start killing people because you don't get the points, you don't get the interest in cargo contracts, you don't get, you don't get any of the stuff that gets given to you as you progress through the, through the game and there is no alternative a lot of the time. Well, it's just like life. You didn't get anywhere in life. You don't murder a few people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is that just me? Uh, my, my girlfriend spent uh, a lot of time playing World of Warcraft and just going fishing. <laughs> and just the amount, the amount of guys who were telling her she was playing the game wrong. It's just like, I just want to go fishing. <laughs> Moving, I mean, it, it applies to games, but I think the question applies to, to wider literature and entertainment as well. But, uh, you know, games are, are stories, aren't they? I mean, games involve stories, and you, you, you know, the players make their own stories to an extent within, within the walls of the game. Um, I think stories get more interesting when moral ambivalence comes in. Um, and therefore, being given the option to explore your moral ambivalence as a player and your imperfections as a player. Is, is fascinating, and the more, the more subtle games do let you do that, uh, rather than just shooters. I mean, yeah, shooters are great, we love shooters. And there's room for shooters in books as well. You know, there's room for a straightforward shoot em up science fiction novel in space, and a great straightforward swords and sandals cut their bits off, fantasy novels, fantastic. But actually, when, when the, the imperfections of the characters and the risks and the moral ambivalence of the characters come to the fore, I think <coughs> that's what makes it more interesting. Yeah. 
Oh, I just think so. Uh, the, you mentioned Jack Cohen in your talk, and I think it was Jack Cohen who I heard long ago tell the story of how apparently we happened to evolve from a fish, ultimately, that had its genitals and its urinary tract um, coupled with the same set of plumbing. And I think uh, that the, the suggestion is that if we hadn't, if we'd happened to have our genitals on our heads, for example, then we would have a very different attitude to, to sex. There'd be fewer taboos about it, fewer sense of it being dirty. Less sense of it being dirty. And you get these sort of um, evolutionary happenstance moments that occur in art, I think, as well as biology. Uh, so to answer your, your point about violence more seriously, it so happens that TRPGs evolved out of war games in 1970s in uh, Wisconsin, wherever it was Gygax and, and his friends were hanging. Uh, and, you know, consequently, baked into the earliest edition of our role-playing rules, how do you get experience points? You kill things. And there have been plenty of systems since then that, that don't allow for that. But that's the sort of starting assumption. Uh, that you hit a thing and gold and XP falls out, which you can then use to buy bigger weapons, which you can then you know, hit bigger things to get larger chunks of gold and XP. So that's the sort of base assumption, and that made its way into digital games as well, because the earliest digital games, Wizardry, Ultima, these sort of things, drew their DNA directly from TRPGs. With each year, there are more and more games where it's possible or desirable to do non-violent things. Some of them fail dismally. Some of them present alternate routes where it's a source of pride to be able to play through the whole game without killing somebody. But it's a source of pride because the fundamental nature of the game is that you, 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 you kill people. But just as science fiction started out in a, a certain number of very constrained activities. Basically, I think as far as I could tell, most early science fiction was about rich men going on holiday. Now, uh, <laughs> you get more and more games that aren't about killing people, but it's still sort of where it started. There's still a lot of rich people going on holiday in science fiction. I'm oh, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Keep moving back. Um, and I, th I think one final point I would say, leading on from that, is, is game are changing. Um, and I'm not going to get too political about this, but uh, there is definitely a gender shift and it's no longer the domain of 18 year old boys uh, who want to kill things and have a lot of adrenaline. Um, but that still exists and that's absolutely fine. Um, but there is increasing uh, recognition that there is a lot of other people out there who might enjoy the medium of games if the games being made are not games that are specifically made to cater to 18 year old boys who want to shoot things. So there is a design principle that's gaining more traction and by some people it's laughed out of court, um, but, but the idea of tend and befriend, which is um, typically uh, a more female centric uh, type of game and this doesn't mean that all games are suddenly going to become you know, pink ponies and, and let's all have hair parties um, but <laughs> I'm pitching that so anybody you know, later. Um, but, but for example one of the most successful independent video games in recent memory is a game called Stardew Valley um, which is a, a, I, I find uh, unattractively sweet um, game where all you do is you inherit a lovely farm from your lovely grandpa and you, and you plant lovely plants and you make lovely friends and you do that forever like literally you, you, people have like thousands of hours in this game and it's just sort of made millions and it's on every console um, and people find it very relaxing and there, there really is this uh, like awareness that people want more now and, and you can it's absolutely uh, normal for people to just put down a, a shooter um, that they really enjoy, that's done really well um, and, and really decide that actually they still want to play a game but they're not feeling in a sort of aggressive adrenaline fueled mood, they're feeling in a I quite like to put some tomatoes over their mood and now we're seeing this, you know, this astonishing uh, uh, success of, of games that are now serving that, so I think that the games will get more um, likely and, and, and more well, I mean I, I think you found Elite very uh, meditative like, I, I, I can't speak for the earlier versions, but when I watch you play it, you don't kill anybody. But anyway, I think there's hope. <laughs> <laughs> Time for one more, maybe? Uh, sure. I, if I may be the final question, but probably about to wrap up very shortly. Okay. A quick one. <coughs> if, you, if you got to write the Doctor Who episode, what would the plot be? 
Well, I'm going to go first in case someone steals my idea. Um, uh, so, so yeah, we've 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 talked briefly about this throughout this session. Um, so I'm I'm going to go for a, a, a full series um, uh, Doctor Who Lovecraft mashup. Um, uh, series series finale. Um, Ali A rises from the waves. Um, we can have we can still have Monster of the Week. Except, of course, the monsters are the great old ones and shock off and <laughs> stuff like that. It'll be brilliant. Uh, obviously, all the companions will either be dead or mad at the end. <laughs> um, or both. I, I don't know how this works. Um, but, yeah, I mean, clearly it will be my one series because no one would ever trust me ever again <laughs> with, with that sort of thing. But, yeah, that's what I'd do. I I just like the idea that the Doctor never ever regenerates again because he's just roaming the TARDIS alone, insane. <laughs> <laughs> Licking condensation off the time. <laughs> <laughs> I also think... I, I, tang. <laughs> <laughs> I also think you should cheer up. I <laughs> have the overwhelming urge to give you a hug. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> which I shall try and resist. <laughs> um, and mine would probably involve um, Celts finding Daleks, which I suspect would be one-sided. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, arguably, a Dalek does look as though it's rather very good kill, doesn't it? <laughs> so, synthesising what we've just heard from the other members of the college, uh, we should be considering... Um, uh, a Doctor Who who never regenerates again in a cleanly setting, um, ideally condemned forever to wander within a very peaceful role playing game where she goes <laughs> tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, failing that, I quite like the, I like, I like the historical ones. I think I would, but Doctor Who works well with historical <laughs> figures and historical settings because it's good, clean fun, and you can go and film it in Spain where it's nice and hot. So I think, I think Doctor <laughs> Who meeting one of the great Greek philosophers would be kind of fun. I think, you know, bring the, a bit serious, but bring the educational thing in, start of science, that would be kind of cool. Uh, alternatively, I think you could put Doctor Who in a, in a, a far space, far future setting. You know, the TARDIS has gone off track as it often does, and zoomed off, and I think it's ended up... In, you know, maybe some kind of artificial galaxy with, uh, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Doctor Who, calling alone. <laughs> and slowly watching the heat death of the... <laughs> As other will be there, anyway. Um, well, I think this is a great opportunity to um, redress a great wrong in the universe, which is um, there was a very formative uh, TV show that I watched a lot as a child, which I think is grossly... Um, underserved by modern sci-fi and fantasy, and this is this is the time we're going to fix that. So I would pitch um, a entire series of Doctor Who um, where the Daleks have been entered into robot wars. <laughs> <laughs> So, as you may have noticed, I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> so my idea for Doctor Who is it going to steal off his idea and pass it off his name? <gasps> I think that's it. <laughs> I missed it too. What was that? What was that? Steal I'm going to steal off his idea and pass it off as my own. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? Are we done? Can we go now? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the bar? <laughs>